Some time ago, I did a full-on review of the Tereva Jakari Puko 110 from Verstalika. Well, now I have its longer version, the Tereva Jakari Puko 140. If you're interested in hearing my thoughts on how these two knives compare one against the other and which one might be the right one for you, Keep watching. All right, just before we get started, a couple of things. First, I'd like to thank Verustalika for sending me the Tereva Jakari Puko 140 so that I could share it with you. The other thing is, in an effort to keep this video to a much shorter length, I'm not gonna go into lengthy demonstrations on how it performs because in all intents and purposes, it's almost identical to the 110 version, which I previously reviewed. So if you're interested in seeing this knife or the 110 version in action, then I'll link the other video to the end of this one and put it in the video description as well. But what I want to focus in on is the differences, how minor that they are between these two knives and how they affect their functionality. So what we're going to do is we're going to go down and focus in on the knife. I'll go over its specifications very briefly. I'll bring the 110 version back in so that you can see the two of them side by side and then I'll just talk about my experiences and how I see them being slightly different. Now there's one more thing we're going to do towards the end of this video and that is compare this knife against another knife that I recently reviewed and I'll explain why I think this is the better buy. If you're interested in hearing all of that, Keep watching. All right, quickly we'll go over the specifications for the Treva Jakari Puko 140, and that starts with the weight. The weight is 6.7 ounces or 190 grams. Now I'm not going to give you the weight with the sheath because there are a few sheath options that we'll discuss a little later, and I couldn't give you the weight for each one of them. Now the blade length 5.5 inches or 140 millimeters. Total length for this knife 10.6 inches, which is 270 millimeters. Blade thickness zero. 0.17th of an inch or 4.2 millimeters. Blade edge angle is 23 degrees and the steel used in this knife is 80 CRV2 hardened to 59 on the HRC. All right, now let's uh, just take a quick look at the sheath before I bring the 110 version of the knife back into view. So the sheath, it's identical. It's identical to pretty much all of the leather sheaths uh, used or sent out by Verustalika with their Tereva Scrama and their Tereva Jakari Pukos. Basically, it is a high quality leather sheath that is formed over a plastic insert down the center here, which gives both the sheath some structure and protection against either crushes from the outside or the knife piercing it from the inside. It is a dedicated dangler, so it, you don't have a, a belt loop in addition to the dangler, but that's just fine. That's the way I like it as well. Now, as you're going to see, this is an extremely secure sheath. Start with, it is in and it's not coming out. At least I'm not going to be able to shake it out. But just in case you are looking for a little extra security, it comes with a dome snap right here that you can shut. And now, short of just pulling with all your might, you're not getting this knife out of the sheath. Now, I don't use that very often, certainly not when I'm doing chores around the camp because um, there's no need for that security, extra security. As I mentioned, it has a lot of security. Probably the only time I use this dome snap is if I'm bushwhacking and I just want to have that extra assurance that I'm not going to catch the knife on anything and pull it out of its sheath. Of course, if you want to prevent that from happening, make sure you don't have a lengthy lanyard on the end of it, just something short like maybe I have here. And again, yes, a little piece of green, bright green paracord because, well, look at it. It's a black knife or a black handled knife and mostly black knife itself with ex of the exception of the sharpened area. And I just don't want to lay it down and not find it again. All right, let's put the sheath back and bring the 110 in. So how am I going to do this? Let's take a look at these two knives. This is the best comparison I can give you. I believe this is lined up precisely on the handles and you can see it's just the length and not a lot either. It's just, well, 40 millimeters or no, 30 millimeters, I guess, in the difference between 110 and 140. So 30 millimeters, not a lot of length. You wouldn't think it makes much of a difference in the performance of this knife, but uh, that's what I'm going to do next is talk about how these two knives differ in their functionality and the way they feel in my hand. All right, so just a bit of a recap on the Tereva Jakari Puko 110. As you know, if you have watched the my other video, this is a full tang knife, and you can see the tang protruding through, but does have a rubber, rubber overmold, so it's not a full tang or full broad tang. In other words, there is no exposed areas inside of the handle. Everything is buried inside of this hard rubber sheath. 
one of the things that I mentioned before that I like about it is how do I, uh, the ratio between the height here and the width here. It's not especially wide, it's wide enough, but not especially wide, but it is nice and deep here. And that makes a huge difference when I'm holding it with my XL hands in terms of controllability. I think everybody will find that this is a much more controllable knife because of that ratio. It has less tendency, if you're really torquing on it in a piece of wood, to want to rotate in your hand because of that. And that's exactly what makes this such a nice knife to use when you're working with wood. Now, let's be clear about this. This is not the best looking knife in my collection. I have some customs and a few production knives that are much nicer looking in terms of aesthetic beauty, but this has a functional beauty that is just unparalleled. I'd have to say that this is probably for its size, the most functional knife I have of all. I do have some finer edge ones, which may do a little bit better in the carving area, but overall, when it comes to strength and uh, all the tasks you use for a knife like this, this has got to be right at the top, or is right at the top of the list. So the things that I like about this knife are the fact that it has a high, now, yes, it's not a true Scandi, and so I know someone's going to say that. I, I started to call it a fairly high Scandi grind, but it's not a true Scandi because it doesn't have a zero degree. It has a micro bevel right at the edge. Now, the micro bevel, of course, is there to give it extra strength right at that edge because a true Scandi, a zero grind right from nothing or right down to nothing, can be very delicate on the edge and often roll or chip. Just that tiny micro bevel has a minor impact on the carving ability, but really almost nothing. But it has a huge impact on the strength of the edge itself. So it's nice to have that. In fact, I would, I think I, most of my knives, the ones that were true Scandies when I got them, like some of the Moras, uh, by stropping them, they pretty soon have a micro bevel of their own. And uh, if it, yours doesn't, you may actually want to consider putting it on. Stropping is really all you need to do to have that occur. Now, the other things that make this knife a little different is it does have a 90 degree edge. Well, well, okay, it's not a 90 degree edge. The edge is angled. Um, this probably won't show up, so I'll exaggerate it. There's an, an angle like this on both sides, and that is there, and, and the reason they do it that way is to go in through the softer outside of the metal into the harder inside. It's just the way that it's heat treated. So you will have a very sharp edge. It may not be 90 degrees, but it is a very sharp edge for all the things that we like to have our sharp edges for, such as ferrocerium scraping or fatwood scraping or wood scraping or bark scraping, any number of things that you want to save your edge from your main primary edge from being abused and use the back of it to do the work. Overall, this is one tough working knife. And yes, it is good looking, but it's a good looking in a functional way. That's the way to uh, describe it. 110 millimeters. It's about the perfect length for a bushcraft knife. Now, this is a bushcraft knife, but because of its heavy duty nature, it could also move into the realm of a light or small survival knife because honestly, you can't destroy these things. I've watched any number of reviews, including reviews by someone who we'll talk about in a few minutes time, has a uh, reputation of destroying every knife he gets because that's the focus of his channel. And he thinks this is probably the strongest knife uh, out there in terms of overall strength. He still broke it, but what he had to go through to break it was just incredible. Okay, now let's bring the 110 back in, or excuse me, the 140. First off, the things I really like about this is just, it's not a, what I'd call a compact size, it is just a good size for a belt knife. Big enough so that you can do all the tasks you wanna do with a bushcraft knife, but not so big that it gets unwieldy. You can still work with this and carve I'm getting flashes of my eyes from <laughs> the, the shiny edge on this, work and carve with it out at the end and not feel like you're working with something that's like a sword or, uh, you know, well, that's a bit of an exaggeration, of course. But yeah, so it is a great knife for that. But, you know, the 140 is all of that. It is all of that. It has all the same features. It's exactly the same in every way. But, you know, that extra 30 millimeters on the end of this knife does make a difference. So, What's the advantage? Why would you want to buy this longer knife instead of just staying with the 110? The single advantage that I find that this knife has over the 110th is the length. And that comes into play when you're doing uh, batoning primarily. And yes, you can baton this 
free will. Just go at it. You're not going to kill it. You're not going to hurt it. You're not going to bend it or break it. Well, you might bend it, but it'll snap back into place. It would have to be quite a piece of wood in order to bend it in the first place. Yeah, so that's the single biggest advantage. You have that extra length so you can span larger pieces of wood, have enough of the blade sticking out on the far end for batoning. That's its greatest advantage. However, that advantage becomes a disadvantage when it comes to carving and a few other things. So what I find is that you know, when, when you're doing feather sticking, most of the time you're using probably that much of the blade from here to here for feather sticking. However, sometimes you get towards the edge so that you can make some very fine curls and if you want them to go off at a different angle. It's when it gets to this length at five and a half inches that it starts to get awkward to do. So I find that it's easier to use for carving of any type really, fine carving that is, with the shorter blade. And the blade profiles are identical. So it's not like your one is better than the other that way. It's just that this is a little long and makes it a little harder to carve with at the end. I will say you get a little bit more leverage if you really have to bear into the wood, but otherwise the control goes to the smaller of the two knives. Now here's the other thing I noticed about it. It does have that same sharp edge, actually very sharp very sharp edge on the back. It'll throw sparks off a ferrocerium rod, it'll scrape fat wood, it'll scrape bark, it'll scrape wood, anything you want it to scrape, it will do it. But when it comes to using this with a ferrocerium rod, it's a bit of a handicap because what I find is that if I'm down on the ground and I've had my ferrocerium rod planted and I push down, I have a tendency to push at a bit of an angle. I don't know if that's going to show. Kind of like with the tip down a little bit. And maybe that's just because of the way my hand is held. I actually have, well, I guess part of what it is is I don't want to smash these knuckles into the ground or the rock that I'm working on. What happens is oftentimes, not often, I had to just be conscious of it and make sure I didn't do it. The tip wants to hit the ground first. So with that little bit of a shorter knife, you can scrape with a little bit more of a natural action without the concern that the tip is going to touch the ground. Okay, that's a minor handicap, and, and it's not truly a handicap, it's just an adaptation that I had to make for use with the longer knife. Because I've used longer knives with ferrocerium rods, I think maybe the crossover was, I was so used to using the shorter knife that I just tried to use it the same way on the longer knife, and that's when it occurred. But overall, no, it's not really a handicap. So, uh, okay. There's one more thing I want to show you about this knife, and, and this may help you decide whether or not you want to purchase it. Okay, just before I bring the other knife I talked about earlier into the picture, I wanted to go back and talk about the sheath just for one more moment, because in the opening I had mentioned that there are options when it comes to which sheath you get with the knife. In fact, to start with, you don't have to buy a sheath at all. You can buy the knife without a sheath. You can also get it with just the plastic liner that is down inside of this sheath. If that's all you want to carry it with, then that's all you need. Or you can take that plastic liner, if you're crafty enough to form a leather sheath around it or have a friend who is, then of course you can do that as well. But they also have a material called Bolatron. And to the uh, best of my knowledge, it's very similar to Kydex in nature in terms of it being a moldable heat moldable type of a plastic. I don't have that sheath to compare with uh, against uh, Kydex, so I can't give you really any comments on it, but it is a nice material, and the way they have the sheath set up, you can strap it to backpacks or any number of things. This has been a choice among a lot of militaries, Scandinavian militaries, for guys buying, or girls, buying their own knives, and very understandable why. So maybe that's where the Bolatron sheath become more popular, because it's something that can be fastened to the webbing gear that they are wearing. Okay, let's put the sheath out of the way. Uh, okay, a little while ago I reviewed the Cold Steel SRK, and uh, it, the, thing, the point of that uh, video was to, to determine whether or not it was a bushcraft knife. And no, it is not. I, I stand by that. It is not a bushcraft knife. It is, by its design, a survival knife. Whether you call it a good survival knife is up to debate. Now, I think I may have offended a number of people who own these knives. By the way, this was the one that was loaned to me by my friend Derek. Derek has since sold it to me. So this is my own knife. And so I can do with it whatever I want without having to fear damaging it and owing uh, Derek a new knife. So this is now my knife. And I'm glad I have it. Don't, don't misunderstand. It's not that I didn't like this knife at all. In fact, I gave it a good review 
within its capabilities. Uh, we won't get into the whole discussion about what is a survival knife and what is a bushcraft knife and where the crossover exists. But yes, there is crossover between those two styles of knives. A bushcraft knife being more of a carving type of knife, a functional knife, a survival knife, more of a do-all, not necessarily great at carving, but uh, something that can do tasks that would help you get through a survival situation. Again, we won't debate whether or not this is a good choice for it. However, at the end of that video, I made the comment that if you are looking for a knife to fill that niche, something that is not overly large, like a huge knife, and I've reviewed some big knives, something that would be really be capable in a survival situation, because of course you do have to carry these things around with you, yet you're looking for something you can still carry on your hip, count on it to do all the chores you would want at around the camp, as well as help you out in a survival situation, that there were options. And the option I mentioned was the Treva Jakari Puko 140. So that's what I want to do now is just give you a little bit of a side by side and tell you why I think if you're considering a knife in this range, this is the one that you want to consider. So uh, once again, this is the SRK. I'm not going to give you all the specifications for it because uh, I just did a video on it, right? But you can go back and have a look at that video. So uh, what I want to do is just give you a comparison visually more than anything else. So here we go. I think that may be the best way to do it. I'm trying to give you both at the same time. Handle length, almost identical. Blade length, yes, the half an inch longer on the SRK, and I think the specs will bear that out for me. Full tang knife, but hidden tang inside of a rubber handle. Full tang knife, but hidden inside of a rubber handle. Uh, textured, Nicely textured all over, or some people might even say aggressively textured all over, and may, maybe they don't mind that. Eh, I can leave it or take it. It's, it's not too bad, but it's a little bit more aggressive than necessary, unless your hands are really, really wet. This is textured, but not in the same way. And this, I have found that, well, it's actually got a lot of grip and a lot of traction on it. I don't see the need to make it any more textured than it already is. But here is where this knife is going to shine over the SRK, the tip. How can I do this? There, let's, well, no, let's put them both in the same direction. Look at the tip on these two knives. First in that profile, and then in this profile. Hopefully that's showing up. That's as close as I can get tip to tip. This knife, you're not gonna break the tip. Well, okay, I don't think you'll ever break the tip. I'd be interested in seeing if somebody could. And we're going to talk about the one video where that was done, but that is the extreme. This is virtually an indestructible knife. And I know somebody says, yeah, but I've seen it broken. We'll talk about that in a moment. This one, I still fear if I stab this into wood that I'm going to break the tiff off if I do any prying at all. Now, why would you pry with a knife in the first place? Well, I wouldn't with a bushcraft knife, maybe slightly slightly prying. I might stab into wood to split it apart, but I wouldn't do a lot of prying with a bushcraft knife. But a survival knife, you may have to do exactly that. So uh, that's why I don't think this makes a good survival knife for that reason. It's because of the tip. Semi-combat knife, it's probably a better combat knife than this, but I don't think it's that much better. But I know, look at that tip. You can't hurt that tip. You just cannot hurt that tip. So that's why I prefer to see this, or I prefer to own myself this knife, the Tereva Jakari Puko 140 over the Cold Steel SRK. Okay, just before we close this video, I want to address a few comments I've had from a couple of my viewers. Now, don't take this negatively. They weren't negative comments, but they were asking me if I had heard or had watched or had seen any evidence of Tereva Jakari Puko uh, losing the quality control over their knives. The comment was that it appears the handle is not as fit on the knife as it used to be, that it will come off of the knife, and that the heat treat is not as good as it used to be. Well, I had not experienced that. I, I have quite a few of these knives now, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, I have 
six of these knives now, and each one is of the equal quality, one to the other. Now, I can't guarantee that Verstalika didn't handpick the knives they sent to me, but I don't think they do. I think they're very honest in terms of what they send out to reviewers like myself. So I started to do some searching around the internet to see if I could find the source of this claim that the knives were not standing up. And I could only find one video, one video that showed the destruction of this knife, the Treva Jakari Puko 140. And I think it's 110 was in a, the version was in another knife. There is a YouTube channel that you may be aware of called Joe X. And Joe X, his whole focus is breaking knives. He just, uh, until they break, that's his claim. That's He does whatever it takes till they break. And he took the Tereva, Tereva Jakari Puko 140 and severely abused this knife. Now he does things like stabbing into car hoods, breaking glass with them, banging them on rocks, chopping rocks with them, banging them on metal pipes, hitting them with rocks as hard as he can, stabbing them in and bending into wood or anything else and bending them at unreal angles, even goes so far to shoot them with a handgun uh, until they break. And he had a real hard time breaking this knife. Now, at one point during that uh, destruction, he did have the handle come loose. Not off, just loose. So the knife, the handle was not non-functional, but it did start to slip back and forward over the inner tang of the knife. I don't think that's a fair way of judging the quality of these knives. Those knives were never intended to do that. I think what the takeaway of that video is that look at just how much abuse. I mean, every knife will break. That's Joe's thing. He can break it. it there's no knife that cannot be broken. Just what does it take to break it? And I think the takeaway from that video is this was one tough competitor. It really took a lot before he could damage these knives in any significant way. So I just wanted to address that, that unless somebody can find me some better evidence that these knives are not up to the standard that Verustalika has been putting out before, then I hope this helps put that to rest. These things are just, these are a long-term investment. Now, last thing we'll talk about is price range. So the price range on these things is, on the, the Treva Jakari Puko 140, is between $61 and $111 Canadian prices. Now, of course, you do have to add shipping into that. So they're not super cheap knives, but they are a real bargain in terms of the quality of the knife itself, especially when you compare it against, and I'm sorry for this, the Cold Steel Survival, or S, Cold Steel SRK. Yeah, it's much cheaper, not here in Canada, it's still $100 here in Canada, but the little extra that you pay for the Tereva Jakari Puko 140, I think is well worth it. Okay, I think it's time to wrap this video up. In the opening, I had hoped that this would not be a long video. Now, what I think it's turned into is a bit of a ramble on comparing this knife against the Cold Steel SRK. I just felt that was necessary because I wanted to show an option to the Cold Steel SRK, and I also wanted to address the issues of quality control from Verustalika. Other than that, if you are interested in this knife and you wonder how it performs as a carving knife, as a wood splitting knife, as a cap knife, then go back and watch my review of the Chikari Puko 110. I think you'll find they're virtually identical. The little bit of length, as I mentioned, extra length of 30 millimeters does give you a little bit more length for batoning with, uh, but it does make it a little bit more awkward for doing fine carving and scraping and that type of thing. What I'll do, of course, is put all the information I have for this knife in the video description below. I'll put the link to my review of the 110 version and my link to the review of the Cold Steel SRK in the video description below. All right, until next time, get out and explore and take that path less travel because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.